preparing. Are to we good to go? It's oh. setting up. It just takes a few seconds. But it should work. Are we recording this as well? Yes. Okay, we're good. We're on. <clears throat> All right. Mike. Leo, let's uh let's get this party started. All right. Yes. Welcome everyone. Welcome to our first live stream here. Actually, not the first one. Maybe it's the second or third live stream. I don't remember. Maybe it's we the first one that tests. we're actually doing a webinar. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so. yeah. All right, Mike, take it away. Take it away. Welcome everyone. Like Leo said, this is one of our first live sessions, our the first live webinar that we're holding here on YouTube. And we're super psyched to have you all with us today. And really our main focus today is us just chewing the fat and really just generating a little bit of buzz about TBLT as always, and our new email subscription service that we call TBLT Made Easy. So today we're gonna talk a little bit of shop and we're gonna hopefully leave you here with a better understanding of TBLT and what it means for your teaching. So really we have three main goals today, folks. So I think first and foremost, we of course want to introduce everyone to this concept of task-based language teaching um, and really make it accessible for, for everyone, regardless of the level you teach, your, the, the profile of students you're interacting with. We believe that TBLT is for everyone and, um, and hopefully today we're gonna make you feel equally as confident. Secondly, we'll talk a little bit about the power of TBLT and how it can actually enhance learner's overall performance. And then finally, we'll finish with a nice foundational overview of the main principles of TBLT, but really what it means, like what does it mean in situ when you're performing tasks and how does that result in a better overall learning experience for your students, okay? But before we do that, of course, we'd just like to introduce ourselves. As the, if this is your first time inter engaging with us um, online, uh, we are Leo, Andrew, and Mike, um, the three amigos of, of uh, Learn Your English. And really, we started in 2016 when we ourselves became a little bit um, spent <laughs> with the teaching industry and, and really the demands that we were facing as individuals and teachers. So we really wanted to create something that really spoke to the work-life balance that teachers often have a difficult time striking. Um, and really, we started with our podcast, but over time, we've developed a series of professional development tools that teachers can use to really help them kind of take control over their lives and where they want to go with their careers. And now we are actually helping teachers turn their private uh, lessons into what we call thriving, sustainable businesses, and really using an asset-based asset teaching approach where you're taking all those resources you've created and turning them into something you can sell and promote. And one of our newest creations is our TBLT Made Easy email subscription service. And as I said earlier, it's about really warming teachers up to this idea of TBLT. But not only that, right? It's really self-serving. <laughs> we want you to be doing less work, right? And what you'll be able to do with this course is really cut down on your lesson prep time. Or for some of you, maybe just even expand from the textbooks that you're using in a way that your students find really meaningful and engaging. And really, we don't want to take this, we don't want to take any more or add any more preparation time to your busy schedules. So what do you get? Well, really, we provide you with ready-made templates and tasks that you can use each month. We also provide some customizable templates. So really, we provide the building blocks. It's up to you to put them together in a way that best suits your students. Um, we actually are confident that all of these tasks can be used across levels, and we speak to that in our emails uh, when, we, when we send them out each month. And, and really, we, we ground them in theory. So when you're doing this, um, while you're reading through the materials, while you're working through the tasks, we're, we're there to kind of reassure you that this does relate to theoretically sound ideas around additional language ac acquisition and how and optimal conditions for learning. And something we're really proud of is that this is our first product that we've um, launched that focuses on inclusivity. So really, we've tried to do that with our pricing. So depending on where you are in the world, um, it is sold for $10, but that's not necessarily the case everywhere. So if you're coming from a developing country 
um, where the exchange rate isn't as comfortable, then we actually have purchasing power parity in place. So you get an automatic discount on your purchase, which is fantastic because really we want to build our network. And again, the more people we help, it, the better for educational society overall. Um, with that in mind, who do we help? Well, we think we speak to a variety of stakeholders. We, we, we work with schools and we help them with their own professional development schemes, but we also work with individual teachers, be they, be they teachers who are in a classroom, teachers who are doing their own virtual thing online, uh, teachers who are brand new to English language teaching, or are maybe transitioning from one career into English language uh, education and really want to uh, draw on some of their experiences and help build their, their business and their careers going forward. And really, I think with that in mind, this is the first part of a four-part series. So over the next four months, we will be engaging with you every last Wednesday of the month with TBLT being our main focus. And again, the main goal is for you to take away things you can use and our first topic today that Leo is going to introduce us to is D for Dewey and education and tasks. And really, as I said, this is the, the kind of the nuts and bolts that you'll need to really bring your own teaching and your task, your experience with task-based language teaching to the next level. Leo, I don't know. Take it away. Yes. Um, as Mike said, wisely and beautifully said, um, I think this is just the starting point for us to understand why task-based language teaching is actually grounded on a more progressive um, philosophy of education as opposed to the traditional philosophy of education. And perhaps we can talk a little bit more about that um, once we get into uh, Dewey. But the idea, as Mike said, everyone here learning a little bit more about task-based language teaching made easy because that's exactly what we're trying to accomplish here. We're really trying to make task-based language teaching accessible because we truly believe that it is a more progressive educational approach. And of course, we're going to be looking at the differences between educative and miseducative tasks and how task-based language teaching is actually very much aligned with this idea of holistic education, educating the whole being, not just parts of it. Okay. With that in mind, let the session begin. If you are watching us live on YouTube, just grab some popcorn, maybe a notepad, a pen, a pencil, and take some notes. There will be an opportunity for questions um, later in the session today. But here we are, educative, uneducative, and miseducative tasks, how tasks are central to language acquisition. And I kind of wanted to start today by talking about this young fella here who is not around us anymore, but I remember reading about John Dewey a long time ago, and it didn't really have that much of an impact on me up until like a couple of months or maybe a year ago when Mike actually shared an article with me. Do you remember that article, Mike? You remember which article I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Pedagogical Creed, was it? Yeah, exactly. The yeah, Pedagogical yeah. Creed. So those of you who are watching this, I highly recommend that you download a copy of that article. It's Maybe only been Mike around for a few years, over a century, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's amazing that such that that document became almost like um a doctrine to me, you know, you know, in a sense that when I read that, it resonated so deeply with me that I said, Wow, well, how come I never really paid that much attention to Dewey? Because a lot of the things that he had written in that document resonated so much with me. And I remember telling Mike, I was like, by the way, thanks for sharing that. And this is exactly what we're talking about here, because I feel like there's a very strong association, a very strong connection, a very strong link between the philosophy that Dewey was talking about, the philosophy of education that he was trying to um, propagate and what we do with task-based language teaching. And great educators, I guess, those of you who are watching this, you are definitely a great educator because you are interested in attending this um, live webinar. But great educators, they actually make learning real. <laughs> the triple R, we like R's, we like acronyms, we like trios, you know, triplets. We it makes learning real, it makes learning relevant, and it makes learning rewarding. And this tradition became interestingly, became very well established in Europe first. But it was Dewey 
who was actually one of the first ones to promote this approach in America and eventually was perceived or seen as a giant in the field of education. So today we're going to be looking at his influence in education and how that influence really connects, really relates to task-based language teaching and language education in general. And one of the things that Dewey said, which is really important and really connects to task-based language teaching, is this idea of learning by doing, not learning, then doing, which seems to be the common thread in, in, in traditional education where students are given a lot of information to memorize, not even learn, and then they have to do something with that information, as opposed to what Dewey was suggesting here, that people can learn by participating in what he calls it. He describes relevant learning experiences, which begs the question, what are these relevant learning experiences? I think if you are a language teacher, if you are a language educator, if you consider yourself to be a great educator, you would be asking yourself this question. You would be asking questions such as, what does this person want to learn? How can we set clear goals? And more importantly, how can we be clear on their and my responsibilities in reaching these goals? So it's not something where I'm here to impart knowledge and you're here to absorb everything and then just regurgitate this. It's no, it's almost like we are working in tandem. We're working together to make these learning experiences relevant. So I'm gonna pause here and ask you, if you're watching on our YouTube channel or if you're here in the live webinar, what kind of learning experiences do you consider relevant? Is a grammar gap fill? a relevant learning experience? Is a role play between two celebrities a relevant learning experience? Let's see what we have on the chat there or the YouTube channel. We have uh, Andrew is, is uh, managing both there. He's multitasking here. <laughs> I'll keep my eye on the, uh, the Zoom chat as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mike, maybe you can tell us more what you about what you've read about um, Dewey and his um, learning experiences before we wait for more responses. Yeah, I think like as 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 Leo's talking here, maybe uh, sorry, as, as Leo's um, asking you to think, and while I'm speaking, maybe you can um, maybe some ideas will come to mind. But Leo's uh, sorry, uh, Dewey's really big on this idea of preparing learners for their future, their current and future communities, right, and what that might look like. So I see here, Glynis is saying like asking a boss for a raise. So yeah, maybe I'm thinking about um, someone who's, who's, who's a worker, who, who is working mm -hmm. in an office environment, someone who wants to move ahead. So that's a very real relevant task because that relates to their current or future communities, the, the, mm -hmm. the person who they want to be. Exactly. Exactly. That's a very good, it's a very good point yeah. there. Organizing a any... potluck party was another one, Leo, that just came oh, through from Marissa. That's a good one. And again, because we want, I mean, that literally is co community, isn't it, Marissa, right? Because you're talking about networking, socializing. Of course, uh, if you're if you're new to a country, if you're a new Canadian, for example, um, living here on the West Coast of Canada, uh, being able to have that knowledge or skill set to organize a potluck party in English would be something that could really help you expand your world and help you, you know, be that active member of the community you probably want to be. Mm -hmm. Filling out a mm -hmm. medical form was another one. Again, that's yes. something people face uh, on a daily basis, right? Exactly. And the I consensus think we... seems to be that celebrity role play is, is a no. Nobody said that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I think that's actually the starting point for, for Dewey uh, in, in Dewey's philosophy and educational theory is exactly what Mike said. It's the world of everyday life. And, and Dewey was very careful in his own writing to make clear what kind of experiences were actually most valuable and most useful. Because according to him, not every learning experience is considered valuable or useful. According to him, some experiences are merely passive affairs. They were pleasant or even painful, 
but they are not educative. And I think that's what we're trying to build here. That's what we're getting to next. So let's evaluate learning experiences. So I'm going to ask you to do a little bit of thinking. If you haven't had any dinner, this might be a little difficult for you. But um, I'm going to show you examples of two tasks, okay? And I want you to maybe spend about 30 seconds, 45 seconds analyzing these two types of tasks in light of what we have just talked about, um, learning experiences, okay? So let's look at the first one right here. Let's see what we have. So here's the first learning experience. You have a picture very busy picture of a day at the, maybe Daytona Beach. I don't know what beach this might be. Maybe it's Copacabana. It might be um, Ubatuba in Sao Paulo. I don't know. It might be one of those beaches. Or it could be uh, Woodbine Beach too. All you places know? I want to go. It doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> so in this learning experience, what we have here as the prompt for learning is you're asking the user or the learner to look at this picture of a beach scene and working again in pairs. They will take turns to make sentences, to write sentences about what is happening in this picture. And of course, learners and users are actually being prompted at the end to remember to use the ING form. So I'll give you 30 seconds to think about this. What is the value of this learning experience? Again, connecting it to what just we just said about doing and um, valuable learning experiences. Do we have any comments there? I hope people are not just trying to guess which beach this is. Alexandra seems pretty confident here. Nothing. There's zero. Yeah, nothing there at all. <laughs> Tell us what you really think, though, Alexander. Yeah, <laughs> it's not real. Thank you, Marissa. Yeah, yeah. Well, not 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 to be confused with unreal, which might have positive connotations, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the second Let's learning. See what else we got? Yeah. Yeah. Do we have any more? No. Should I move on? Yeah, no, let's, let's move on. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious to see what this next activity is. Yeah. So let's look at the second learning experience. So right here we have a family tree and it starts by asking the user or the learner, how good are you at names? And eventually they have to talk to their partner about their family. Of course, you have two options. If you're not married, start with your parents, then go on to talk about your siblings. Or if you are married, start with your brothers and sisters, then go on to talk about your partner, husband, wife, and eventually children. Once you've done that, you are asked to write the names of your partner's family on a family tree. So you're actually doing something, right? You're going back to what Dewey said, learning by doing, right? And eventually we are prompted with how many names can you remember? Don't look at your partner's family tree. Which of you has the better memory? And I could even say, once learners have finished this, we can even ask them to write some sentences about their family and then some write some more sentences about their partner's family and then uh, give your sentences to each other to see how many of those sentences are actually accurate in terms of information. So I want you to compare these two learning experiences, okay? So we can, uh, we can get into, um, into Dewey's... In a, in, a, in a second. Do we have any nice comments coming up there, Mike, Andrew? Not yet. I think, uh, I think they're all writing their family tree. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I think the question that I have is, are these two learning experiences mm, right. the same? Yeah. Yeah. So Alexandra, I think I think Alexandra maybe is referring to the latter, right? She says it's mm -hmm. better. Yeah. Glennis is saying information of use in a real in the real world. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, Marissa is saying that the second one um, is involving a lot more is more involving and more meaningful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What's really interesting for us to um, keep in mind here, and Mike, we can we can both talk a little bit more about this. Is this idea that 
of course, maybe in the real world, you don't have to draw someone else's family tree, right? But if you are at work and you are at an event, you eventually will have to talk a little bit about your family with a new coworker, right? So that is somewhat related to that real world experience, right? Absolutely. And I think that sometimes it's even just as simple as uh, being at a bar. So when I was in Japan, a lot of people were quite curious about, you know, me being from Canada, but they were like, oh, um, you know, where, but where are your ancestors from? Because they knew that Canada was a country of immigrants. So my last name is Landry and it's French. So they, of course, wanted to know if I had grandmothers or grandparents that spoke French. And I, I would have to explain a little bit, oh, well, actually, let me explain about my lineage a little bit in detail. And on a napkin, I would kind of draw like an impromptu um, family tree. But I think these things do come up. And I think it's a little bit more realistic than someone asking me to uh, describe what's happening at uh, Tokyo Station and uh, use the con <laughs> present continuous tense, right? So so again, it's as, um, as our participants mentioned, there's just a little bit more reality embedded to this, but also yeah. it's, as someone said, it's more involved, right? Yeah. 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 There's a lot more cognitive actions and reactions taking place there. Yeah. Well, yeah, and and, and basically, Mike, what and everyone watching this, um, this is what Dewey actually had to say about learning experiences. He actually believed that genuine education actually stems from comes through these experiences, but not every single experience that we engage in qualifies as being educative, right? Um, and he actually, I like how he, in the last part of this quote, he says that experience and education cannot be directly equated to each other because some experiences are, as he describes, miseducative. And I think this is what we need to get into now is the difference between experiences that are considered educative and experiences that are considered miseducative. And why do I say this? Because I remember when I used to be a director of studies and I used to observe teachers, I remember a lot of teachers saying to me, yes, but my students had a lot of fun. They were, they, they, they enjoy the activity. I said, that's great. Maybe they had fun, but that doesn't mean that the experience was actually educative in itself. So having fun doesn't necessarily mean that the educate that the experience is actually educative. So not there's a difference. There's, there's no specific um, correlation between a learning experience and education. So let's look at the differences between these two types um, or these two kinds of experiences. So um, a miseducative experience is, I mean, what, what do we know? Well, we know that learning occurs through experience. That's what Dewey said. And experiences can be also miseducative. I think miseducative experiences, in my view, the way I see it, it's the kind of experience that causes a rut. So that same behavior is often repeated without variation, which would be the, the case, Mike, of you describing what's happening at the beach. The boy is swimming. The girl is building a sandcastle. You know, it's... It's the same behavior repeated without variation as opposed to the other experience where you're talking about your family tree. You're talking about people in your family, which might generate a lot of genuine questions, a lot of genuine exchange of information. And this kind of activity may cause enjoyment, which goes back to what I said earlier about teachers saying, but my students had fun. Yes, miseducative activities, miseducative experiences may cause enjoyment, but in a careless way. Why? Because these are completely disconnected experiences from what we actually are preparing ourselves for in the real world. And of course, I think there is, and I think the biggest problem for me is that it really links learning to boredom. When people tell me learning is boring, that's because they're probably engaging in miseducative experiences. OK, and there's actually a very good quote here from um, Rogers, where he basically said the person is close to the impact the environment may have on him and her and the impact that the, that the impact that they might have on the environment. So you are affected by the environment and you also affect the environment. So in, in a miseducative experience, you might be close to that. OK.
Mike, do you want to add anything to this? No, I, I, I think I think you're right. I think um, that that there's this over kind of tendency over focus on on fun and uh, yes and and or as you said the opposite that if we're learning we're not having fun which I think is more detrimental and I'm glad that you made exactly. that point because that's really why we feel passionate about t- TBLT and that's why the 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 subscription is so useful for teachers because we're really trying to make that connection between meaningful uh, language acquisition and also fun and motivation and enjoyment edutainment Absolutely. yeah but that's been bastardized that word over time but i totally get where you're coming from alexandra it's just it's been co-opted by people uh in in a negative way i find but you're right yeah, exactly. what you're feeling there the the sentiment is correct yeah and the second kind of experience according according to dewey is educative and those are the kinds of experiences that provide this indispensable stimulus to thinking and also to something that Dewey was really um, a strong proponent of, which is this idea of reflective um, inquiry, which again, I would connect to um, Socrates in the sense that if he, Socrates said, wisely said that a life uh, not examined is not a life worth living. And I would say a learning experience not examined is not a learning experience worth worthy of experience or worthy experiencing. So it's the same idea here, right? And he also suggests that an educative experience involves two important components, and those are interaction and um, continuity. So let's look at what interaction and continuity actually me let's look at this interplay of interaction and this idea of continuity again an educative experience primarily arises when a learner's way of understanding something clashes with a new idea or a new situation they encounter right so you have this clash okay you have this, like, for example, in the case of the family, describing your family, there is going to be a clash because I might assume that Mike is single and he doesn't have any children. But once I start talking to him, I realize that he's actually, you know, he's, he's been married and he can tell me more about his family. I thought he was actually from, I don't know, Ecuador, but he's actually from Nova Scotia. So this clash is what really creates this educative experience. And what really happens in a very, um, in a very well-designed learning experience, um, educative experience, I should say, is that when the learner is faced with this disequilibrium, they have to modify their way of thinking to accommodate this new um, experience. And that happens through interaction, Right, these transactions between the individual and the environment, where both are altering each other, and of course the idea of continuity, which is basically what I said. When you are faced with this disequilibrium, you have to modify the way you think so as to accommodate this new um, experience. Mike, yeah, and I think with the continuity, it's really important because. That's what Bruner was talking about with the spiral curriculum, right? Like mm. we're, what we're doing in that stage is we're going through and thinking about our past experiences that we've had talking about our families, talking about family trees. Mm-hmm. And we're kind of modifying our language, modifying our ideas and, and forcing, compelling ourselves to, to draw on that vocabulary that we might have learned three weeks ago, right? So when we're thinking about continuity in terms of language acquisition, it's very much the, the drawing into um, all of those words and all of those language resources we have and recycling them, right? So that's where we think, that's what we think of when we think of recycling information. So it's taking and learning from the past and adding it to this new and interaction that you currently find yourself in. Because no two experiences are ever the same. Exactly. But the way you respond to them depends very much on your previous experience and what you've learned from. That and it's experience. funny you say that, Mike, because how many times do we actually talk about the same topics over and over again? Yeah, but this people, intro, yeah, so, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, please, no that's sorry. it. I was I just going to say yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. And how many, and I think from a teaching perspective, and I know that some of our subscribers, and I, I see that we have members of our community out there, we talk, to, we talk a lot about this, how, how students love to repeat tasks. They love to have a second kick at the can. They love to be able to 
try out what they've learned again in a slightly different situation. It is Glynis. Yeah, it is a little bit like experiential learning, but it's on a on a smaller kind of micro scale where we're always mm-hmm. asking our students to to um, revisit and revise and 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 improve and develop. Right. Yeah. 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 And that's exactly the the uh, disequilibrium that we were talking about because they have to be constantly modifying the way they think, which brings us to our final thoughts. Yes, we're making it on time today. Look at that. <laughs> it is, again, this natural form of learning from experience, learning by doing, and then, of course, being provided with an opportunity to reflect on what happened that makes learning this ex- this, this edu- learning experience more educative. And as Dewey said, people can develop their pro- problem-solving skills. They can clarify the learning and eventually find a way to apply these lessons in their um, in their daily lives. And I would like to wrap up our uh, first um, live YouTube webinar with this quote by, by Dewey, which to me resonates so much with what task-based language teaching is all about, which is this idea of giving learners something to do, not something to learn. If we go back to those two previous experiences, one, we are giving students something to do, and in the other one, we're giving them something to learn. But it is in the doing that we result in thinking. And of course, the result of that is that learning naturally occurs. And you'll find that in the TBLT Made Easy email subscription, because really what we're looking at is reducing lesson prep. So we're getting you to reflect on what your students need to do, want to do, um, and we're, we're, we're providing you with tasks and templates for exactly. ideas, but also ways of customizing and, of course, um, ideas for retasking. Because we do think that it's important to give students not only one chance to do a task, but to give them multiple opportunities to do a task. So exactly, we really, it's something we practice what we preach, and we really hope that teachers find it useful in their own unique teaching context as well. And they will continue to learn by doing, not learn, That's right. then do. Folks, thank you very much for listening, for watching us. If you are here, don't forget to um, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit us up on social media. We are not everywhere. We're not on TikTok, but you will find us on Instagram and Learn Your English. We are also on Twitter. If you are watching this on YouTube, don't forget to hit the subscribe button here and join our channel. We have a lot more videos coming up in September. And we also have, as Mike said, in the last Wednesday of the next couple of months, September, October, and November, not December because it's Christmas. But up until November, you will have a chance to interact with us here on our YouTube channel. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast, Teacher Talking Time podcast, which you can find in any um, podcatcher or podcast uh, platform um, of your liking. So thank you very much for watching this. And I think we have about maybe a minute or two for questions, if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask. And I just wanted to say a little bit late to the party here, but for the TBLT Made Easy, it is a monthly subscription. And every month we do focus on six types of tasks. Uh, in September, mm. we're recording this today is August 24th, at least in this part of the world. I know we have some people here who are probably, it's already the 25th. Thank you for staying up so late, as Thank always. You. Um, in September, we're focusing on listing tasks. So that's task type number one, so there's time to jump in. And then in October, we'll focus on, uh, I believe it's ordering and sorting, but don't quote me on that, um, a different <laughs> type of task in October, and then November, a different type. So there's still time to jump in if you're into listing tasks for September. Now, questions or comments? I see one here from Marisa saying that TikTok is not about dancing anymore. Oh. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) That's good to know because we were definitely not willing to um, dance on TikTok. I think so. No, 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 no. Although if you you search deep enough and and dig deep enough into Instagram, I think there's a uh, a video of me dancing, a little bit of salsa. I I have tight hips, so I can't really dance. But they never lie. They never lie, Leo. That's right. That's right. 
I think that's it, folks. I don't think we have any questions. Um, thanks to everyone who watched this on YouTube. Once again, don't forget to subscribe to our um, YouTube channel. Um, if you have a, a, a teacher friend or a group of friends who are also language teachers, don't forget to recommend our work to them. We are very much um, trying to disrupt language education as much as we can and really trying to help teachers um, you know, breathe a different kind of air, something fresher, something that is more consistent with how education should be more progressive and not as traditional. Amen. <laughs>